Modern Agile Procurement. So Chris is a former Presidential Innovation Fellow who is passionate about improving the way government delivers public services through human-centered and digital solutions. He co-founded the digital consultancy 18F within GSA and speaks uh, frequently about modern government procurement and other Agile practices. He's prepared a poll for us that's going to pop up on our screen. And if we could all just take a moment to respond to it. Um, I'm going to read it here. It says, my organization is aligning its acquisition practices with agile delivery practices in first no projects, some projects, most projects, or all projects. So go ahead and vote. And then I will read the responses. And Chris, um, you're welcome to start sharing your slides. So the results are that 12% of our audience said their organization is aligning its acquisition practices with agile delivery practices with no projects. 43% said some projects. 25% said most projects. And 20% said all projects. Great. And now, Chris, over to you. OK, great. Let me do my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? We do. Excellent. OK. All right, so good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Chris Karens, one of the many 18F co-founders that you'll meet today. Uh, over the past uh, three years while at 18F, I've been mostly focused on changing the way government buys technology to deliver great outcomes for the public. Um, I've been particularly focused on procurements that involve custom software solutions. In addition to procurement, I've also spent quite a bit of time helping federal CIOs undertake comprehensive digital transformation initiatives. Uh, as many of you are well aware, procurement has been sort of a challenge for the government over the years. If you just take a look at the federal government alone, it spends about $80 billion per year on IT, and unfortunately doesn't always receive the full values worth of that money. And there have been uh, a lot of notable failures, as you can see there, that have unfortunately squandered you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and really haven't, hasn't left the public off um, in a better spot. So I mean, if you think about the central role that procurement plays in supporting critical mission functions and providing services to citizens uh, for you know, securing a homeland to you know, supporting warfighters to uh, empowering those with special needs, it's too important not to deliver great results consistently. And in today's digital age, you know, technology is becoming more and more the mission of government. And on top of that, if you look at government's a high reliance on external vendors to deliver tech services, uh, IT procurement is something that we, we have to be able to get right. And in my humble opinion, it's it really a matter of public importance in doing this the right way. So what causes IT procurement to fail in government, uh, particularly those involving uh, custom software solutions? Well, there are a myriad of reasons. And if, if you talk to various people, you'll, you'll get different reasons. But uh, to me, these are the three biggest ones here is that, you know, first, the government has really developed an institution of waterfall around how it buys technology. Now, waterfall is uh, really based on you know, two faulty assumptions. You know, one, that all requirements can be known up front and that people don't change their mind. And you know when it comes to you know, product development that that's not the case. And when you think about some of the characteristics of waterfall, such as big upfront design, people working in functional silos, throwing deliverables over the wall and so on, that's very much the form and function of procurement in government, although that is starting to change uh, based on like the poll results I just saw. Um, you know, second, there are a lot of important um, tech decisions being made before and after contract award by non-technical people. And th there's, there's a lot of competition for government work and vendors are in the sales business. So in reality, it's important to have uh, so it's really important to have people who can sort between the fakers and the makers, uh, people who can make intelligent trade-off decisions about the technical direction of a project. And, and the, third, um, the third reason here is that the government procurement culture is really risk adverse. You know, everything, 
the government does is subject to public scrutiny and that's for good reasons and that in and of itself instills a feel of failure mentality in public servants and when you add on the disastrous public IT failures um, people have become even more risk adverse and uh, unfortunately that and you need to take all those public disasters the IT public disasters like healthcare like up um, that all further compounds these inherent issues with waterfall because people spend even more time perfecting requirements leading to longer procurement cycles and all the associated issues that come with that. And, you know, that risk addition also limits people's willingness to experiment with potentially new and effective ways of buying. And lastly, it, it's really created this, this environment with onerous governance procedures and other constraints in which teams um, aren't really empowered to execute the work um, that they see, uh, that they best see fit. So what needs to change in government to be more effective buyers? Well, at a high level, right, you have this magic elixir in Agile uh, that we know to, to be an effective approach when it comes to software development. And so, you know, what we need to do here is marry the two disciplines of Agile and acquisition together. And this has commonly been uh, called Agile acquisition. And through agile acquisition approach, you know, we, we, we can and we have seen faster delivery of value, you know, higher quality and lower cost from our procurement efforts. So based on my experience, what I, I've come up here uh, with a few a little list of guiding self reinforcing principles for, uh, for conducting agile acquisitions. Now you have to keep in mind that this is this is very much a new discipline. And as a community, we're learning all the time about how to do this better and better. Now, many of the principles that you've seen listed, I've seen work really well in practice. Um, others from a practitioner standpoint, you know, still have a ways to go, but progress is being made and we need to sh strive towards really putting these principles into good practice. Uh, the first principle here, um, empower dedicated cross-functional teams with experienced technical brains. You know, government has long held the concept of integrated um, project teams as procurement best practice. Uh, fortunately, the government hasn't always executed this very consistently, and it's something that we need to do and be more disciplined about. Uh, dedicated cross-functional teams, I'm sure many have many of you experienced it, produce better, faster results, uh, reduce bottlenecks and miscommunications and things like that. And they also need to feature smart technical people. I mean, I'm at the point now where I can barely count the number of times in which I've seen you know, having smart technical people at the table um, help government avoid you know, tens of millions in necessary tech costs through uh, sound technical decisions, decisions such as, um, you know, when to use a viable open source alternative over expensive cot solution or, you know, when a simple static website will serve over a complicated Oracle database cl cluster. Um, my last point here is that, you know, management really has to set these teams up for success and give them the space to experiment, learn, and self-organize. Uh, next principle, assign an empowered product owner. And this comes straight out of the Agile manifesto. Um, should be no surprise to Agile practitioners here. Um, management by committee simply doesn't work. Um, you need to empower someone. Uh, you need to power someone to own the product from start to finish and hold them accountable for the results. Uh, next principle: uh, make use of prototypes. I mean, prototypes are a great way to answer important design architecture questions, especially during a pre-award planning stage. You know, can you wrap a legacy system in an API? You know, can are we actually solving the right problem? Uh, these are important questions to, to address to shape the overall procurement and, and the sooner that you can answer them, the better. Uh, prototypes also have also provide a great way to give vendors uh, greater insight into the context of the product. And the more understanding that they have of the con that context, the more confident that they're going to be in putting forth their proposals. Uh, next principle, uh, employ performance-based and challenge-based contracting techniques. Uh, one of the core concepts behind agile acquisitions is that you know, you're buying a cross-functional team for a fixed time and budget, but variable scope. So um, performance-based contracting and the use of a statement of objectives and performance uh, work statements work really well with this concept. Um, they also reduce the amount of time it takes to put a solicitation out on the street because you're not issuing lengthy requirements documents. Uh, Challenge-based agreements. Uh, challenges are an excellent way of evaluating companies based on demonstrated capability uh, as opposed to embellished proposal um, narratives. You know. uh, but you really do need technical people for that. And that's where sort of this, the self-reinforcing nature of some of these, these principles come into play here. 
Uh, modularized contracts, big, amp, big bang implementations, you know, simply don't work. Hopefully they're a thing of the past. You know, they limit competition. Uh, it, break the acquisition into modular chunks that can be worked on by potentially multiple vendors, uh, in some cases of different specialties. Uh, keep in mind that this approach uh, does put the onus on government to act more as a system integrator, right, which, um, which is all the more reason to employ, you know, smart technical people on the team to help facilitate, facilitate those types of integrations. Uh, also, uh, modularizing contracts is, is also a function of modular architecture and engineering approaches. For example, you know, how can different parts of the system talk to each other through, through APIs you know, with, with different vendor teams uh, working on those different components? Uh, next principle, use public domain procurement. The, you know, make, make the vendor, as, as part of the contract, agree to commit all code and deliverables to the public domain via open source repositories. Uh, this, this helps to avoid uh, vendor lock-in issues over who owns the code and the data and makes knowledge transfer much faster um, when, you, when you're at the point where you need to switch vendors. Perhaps, you know, the one you're working with is underperforming. Um, another principle, uh, aim, aim to procure at the speed of agile development cycles. The, the reality is that we live in a world where requirements are evolving and emerging all the time. Uh, we need to be able to execute procurements rapidly. Uh, now, I've yet to see this done really well in practice, but I am beginning to see, uh, you know, based on how some of these principles are being put into play, that as a community, you know, we, can, we can get there, we can get to that point. Next principle, strive for systemic agility. You know, it, it only takes uh, one bottleneck in the acquisition process, you know, whether it's security or the legal department to slow down shipping a great product to users. Uh, I've yet to see an operation, again, you know, again, I've yet to see an operation achieve systemic agility, but I'm definitely seeing organizations take more and more of a, of a systems view of the problem and trying to eliminate bottlenecks in the process. Uh, a is actually doing a lot of interesting work around trying to automate uh, security controls testing, for example. Uh, next principle, if it's, a, if it's important to your mission, build it. I've seen a lot of or organizations just paralyzed by this build versus buy analysis. I've also seen a lot of uh, bot systems that support unique critical mission functions based on this premise that a COT solution would work. Um, I'm not saying don't use COT solutions, absolutely do, but I, as a general principle, I advise don't architect the core of your system um, around a COT solution. You know, build it, build that core, and, and then integrate COT solutions around it as necessary. And last principle here, sort of a catch-all, um, adhere to the US Digital Services Playbook. I mean, this is a great document. Um, it, 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 it outline it enumerates um, many great um, modern principles uh, and practices for delivering uh, product in today's age. And it's, it's been something that's actually been very transformative in the government. And next slide here. So agile acquisition principles in, in action. So uh, there's a list of a few, there, there's actually a number of, of great uh, projects, but perhaps many of you um, have case studies of your own, but three of here that I listed that I, I think really did a good job putting these principles in action. The first is, you know, ATNS Agile Delivery Services Marketplace. Uh, this was an effort to create a curated marketplace of Agile of vendors. And that the way that this, the way that we ran this is we, we used a prototype as proposal approach where we had vendors submit working code based on um, FDA's open, open FDA um, API data set. And we had highly technical people evaluating those product, prototypes and making award decisions based on um, actual demonstrated capability and it led to really great results. Uh, State of California's uh, child welfare system, we, we deployed an, an 18F agile acquisition team to work with the state of California. Um, they, they took a 1500 page contracting document uh, over the course of the month and trimmed it down to a modular RFP of about uh, of a 10 page statement of work and another 60 pages of mandatory contracting uh, language. And that uh, they're, they're in, the, in the execution stages now and that effort has been going great. And um, they really credit um, some of that, that application of these principles to helping them, you know, save tens of, avoid tens of million dollars, tens of million dollars in, in tech costs and things like that. Uh, Last one here, Environmental Protection Agencies, E-Manifest. Actually, this is a program that was under Ann Duncan and, and Greg Godbout, who are speakers here today. And uh, EPA and ATNF had, had worked together to um, sort of turn around a program that had been suffering the ill effects of waterfall for about 15 years. Uh, and through many of these, these principles had been able to move that program forward 
um, in ways that it hasn't been able to for the past 15 years. So uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about those case studies and anything else that I've gone over in this uh, presentation and a Q&A session. I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, it's, it's been fun putting this all together. I've had an opportunity now doing this to sort of coalesce some of my thoughts and the learnings over the past three years. So I hope you found it beneficial and look forward to talking to you some more. And there's my contact information if, if you want to get a hold of me after this conference. Thank you.